Good day, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and give you a talk about diabetic armamentarium. The name of the talk is just to address the issue of the numerous number of drugs and ter therapies which are available currently for the management of diabetic. We are dealing with the really zoo of the medication and this is a challenge for everyone who is dealing with diabetic patient to choose the proper one. So I choose the title of this uh, lecture as a little black number of catwalk band of orchestra. There is disclosures. Um, thanks uh, um, AstraZeneca for inviting me. I don't have any disclosures. In dealing with any chronic disease and diabetes is a good example, we should remember that education is an essential part of the management. And the science of communication show us that we are failing uh, with this task. For instance, if we try to give too many messages and we will repeat this only once, the patient will retrieve none. If you are giving three messages, we try to repeat them three times, the science of communication show us that we will be lucky if the patient will remember one uh, message. So in essence, dealing with numerous therapies available, very complicated, we need to remember about the partner who is listening to us and dealing with this. We need to make sure that communication and the transfer of this information is adequate. I put these slides because uh, the so-called uh, little black number, the uh, iconic dress made by Coco Chanel is almost 100 years old. And this is exactly the time, how old is the insulin? Coco Chanel in the fashion industry is like a insulin is in the management of diabetes. Essentially, doesn't matter if it's type one or type two diabetes, the insulin is able to control hyperglycemia independent of the initial glucose level. This same like a little black number can be a nice dress for the party, for the official event or just for the nice evening. Have a look on this graph showing the development of diabetic armamentarium over the last 100 years. For a long period, until 90s, 1995, essentially we've been having only available insulin, different insulins, of course, a little bit of oral agents, metformin and sulfa drugs, and then nothing. And only during the last 15, 20 years, there is so many different options to so many different drugs to choose to treat our diabetics better. Using another musical analogy, I want to compare this to the situation like with the jazz. At the beginning, the small quartets, quintets would be the mainstream of the jazz. And Miles Davis quintet is the good example. They were able to play with few instruments, amazing music. The Miles Davis album, Kind of Blue, is still best-selling jazz album of all the years. The same happening now with diabetes. We started with few only medications trying to treat patients with hyperglycemia. But now we learn that we need to address more other issues. For instance, weight management, adverse events of therapy, uh, multiple pathophysiological effects of, um, in, in, the, in diabetes. As well, we learned that because the patients are dying mostly because of cardiovascular renal complications, this issue should be addressed as well. So the new drugs should promote the weight loss. They need to correct all possible pathophysiological effects, giving as little as possible risk of the hypoglycemia, complement each other, as well try to reduce the cardiovascular ease. So essentially the focus on the glycemia is much wider now. We are looking on other uh, sides of therapy as well. And it was interesting how during last 20 years, the development of the new classes of drugs started. For instance, comparison of the structure of the uh, incretins, uh, human uh, uh, incretins um, uh, revealed that there is a similarity between the exenatide, which is present in saliva of Gila monster, and the synthesis of exenatide and the drugs based on this kind of uh, structure was uh, essentially was a backbone of the new class of the drugs, GLP-1 receptor agonist, 
which are gaining momentum and getting more and more popular in the management of our metabolic patients. The mechanism of action is complicated, involves uh, different organs, starting with the brain, controlling the appetite, the center of satiety, affecting the gastrointestinal tract, slowing the emptying of the stomach, slowing the digestion, preventing hyperglycemic episode following the ingestion of the food, addressing the beta cell response to glucose in glucose-dependent manner, which means they are safe, they're not giving hypoglycemia. From the other side, addressing also secretion of glucagon, so preventing hyperglycemia. These new drugs are really the uh, very powerful tools in the management of diabetes. Another interesting development and source of the new class of drugs, uh, flozins, are just discovered in the bark of the apple tree. The receptor, which is in the proximal tubular system, sodium glucose transporter, shows that by blocking this transporter, we can prevent the reabsorption of the glucose from the urine. Usually during the day, about 180 grams of glucose is going through the filtration process to the tubular system and is absorbing quite effectively. In the patient with hyperglycemia, obviously this excess is released. What are the sodium glucose uh, um, uh, transporters inhibitor are doing is just preventing the reabsorption of this um, glucose, um, eliminating plus minus 200 grams of glucose, which obviously produce the lower peaks of the glycemia after meals, as well as uh, some caloric loss, which assists with the weight loss. What is interesting is like uh, sailing on charted water, uh, you may be exposed or you will find something which nobody even thought can be uh, possible. In management of diabetes, the holy grail is to try to reduce the cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. The medication we used to have in the past, insulin, sulfa drugs, DPP-4 inhibitors, they were controlling hyperglycemia quite well, but they were not really making any significant difference with cardiovascular mortality. And have a look, the studies done with the GLPs revealed that, for instance, liraglutide, used in the patient with cardiovascular disease or patient at risk to cardiovascular disease, produce significant reduction of the cardiovascular outcomes measured by total mortality, cardiovascular mortality, or just MACEs, which is uh, related to the heart complications, complications. Interestingly, the new class of drug, uh, SGL2 inhibitors, got the same kind of benefit. In this case, the study presented in 2005 in Stockholm, Emparec trial for the first time revealed that if you're using empagliflozin in the patient with cardiovascular uh, uh, disease, established cardiovascular disease, you can reduce total mortality and cardiovascular outcomes, particularly heart failure significantly up to 30%. And this is across the class of the SGL2 inhibitors. The studies done with dapaglifosin in the patient with uh, heart failure, with um, redu reduced ejection fart, uh, fraction cardiomyopathy, shows that this benefit is similar to empagliflozin. And the study just recently published um, during the meeting in Europe um, shows that even in patients with preserved ejection fraction, which is more than 40% to 50% or even higher, the SGL2 are also have got the same kind of benefit. So this class of drug beyond lowering the glycemia is also very effective medication in the patient with cardiovascular disease. Essentially, it was hijacked by a um, cardiologist and used in patients without diabetes even because the mechanism of action is independent of the glycemia. A little bit discussion about the combination of two different drugs or even more. And to start with the um, example from in, uh, science about the wine, the best wines, the Bordeaux wines, can be made from combination of two blends, Sauvignon Blanc, Blanc and Semillon. And the best, one of the best white Bordeaux is called Chateau Brion, 
can go up to $1,000 per bottle because the quality of this tool is giving you extra, uh, extra value. So the same happening in the um, therapy or uh, armamentarium of the diabetes. We can combine different agents simply to increase simplicity of the treatment. And we can combine two or three oral agents to make two from instead two or three pills, one pill. But this is nothing special. But if you combine two different agents with complementary me mechanisms of action, you may have something extra addition. And this slide is showing now that we can use basal insulin and the GLP-1 receptor therapy or agents together to minimize the side effects, especially nausea, because we are able to use lower doses and the same way improve the glycemic effect, the HbA1c reduction is fasting sugar reduction, postprandial glucose reduction is equal or even better using the combination. So in the patient who are failing for some reason therapy with GLP-1s, you may think about the adding the combination with long acting insulin as a two agents or even, even one, one, one kind of um, uh, 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 pen to, to assist with the better control of the diabetes. For a long time, we've got only on our market, you know, Pinot, Pinotage, which is a nice combination of Cinso and Pinot Noir, which is giving you both the strength, strength and the taste. So the best Pinotage, you know, are, are really very pricey. But for the last few uh, months, we do have on the market two pens with combination of long-acting insulin, Glargin and Degludec, together with GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, with liraglutide and lixizinatide. These pens are easy. They going through the small steps, increasing the dose of insulin and uh, SGL2 is stepwise process. It takes some time, but this is the best way to avoid side effects, especially gastrointestinal side effects, as well as hypoglycemia, which can be related to the using too big doses of insulin. So in essence, we've got a, a medication or system of giving two medications in one pen, which is easy, user-friendly, plus helping to minimize the side effects of, for instance, weight gain and uh, hypoglycemia, which is due to the insulin, or minimize the side effects of GLP-1s, especially nausea and vomiting. I want to show you something which will come to South African market soon. The studies with semaglutide, which is currently available only as an injectable, uh, shows that you may prevent the degradation of this protein in the stomach by forming special snack carrier. And then this medication used orally will give you all the benefits to uh, typical for the GLP-1 receptor agonist therapies. But interestingly, the benefit talking about the glycemic control, uh, cardiovascular outcomes is even maybe, and weight loss is even maybe more significant than with so-called and available injectable ther therapies. We also been involved at some stage with doing study with GLP-1s released through the uh, osmotic mini pump. The size of this osmotic pump, you can see on the left corner, bottom corner, is like as much. And then inside, you've got a, enough medication for six months. So every six months, you need to just put this under the skin, small cut. It can be done in the doctor's office. And then after six months, just release. Through the osmotic mechanism, the drug is slowly released to the body and control the uh, control the glycemia and give all the aspects of typical for the GLP-1s. The compliance is 100%. The patient loves this. But unfortunately, the, 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 this technique is still, you know, kind of uh, um, uh, not uh, available in, in many countries. The company is struggling with the registration. Probably everybody heard about um, insulin, inhaled insulins. The theory behind is that if you use short-acting insulin as an inhaled insulin before meals, you will really avoid the injections. Unfortunately, the first insulin, which was uh, designed years ago, the device was really cumbersome. As you can see, 
it was not nice to sit in the front of the restaurant with the device like that. So the companies didn't even start. It was a, a commercial uh, a disaster. The new inherent insulin, which are available now, are much, much smaller, the size of the you know, MDI for the asthma treatment, and they deliver insulin in the small steps. They are popular the way that they can really help to avoid the burden of injection. There is uh, some issues with the absorption, which is not maybe always 100% as we wish. It can be affected by smoking and um, um, uh, pre presence of other chronic lung disease. But this is an interesting way to, 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 to provide insulin. The problem is the cost, and this is probably why it's not getting momentum. On this slide, I'll show you how the insulin evolved over the period of last 100 years. You got a timing of uh, action of the insulin on the bottom, on the axis, up to 24 hours or longer, and the insulin level on the left. So the first insulin, the long-acting insulin and short regular were working up to 16, 18 hours. The regular insulin is usually six to eight hours. Then the technology allowed to develop the long-acting insulin, Zetamir glargin, which can be used single injection a day. And on the left, you got the rapid insulin analogs, Lispro, Aspart, and Glulizin. And we are still thinking about the making insulin working faster because even with rapid acting insulin, you need to inject this insulin about 15 minutes before meal to match the insulin action with the spike peaks of the glycemia. This is why there is a development of ultra rapid acting insulins, which are on the market already. And they are ideal for the management of the patient who are on insulin pumps. They're working very, very fast, similar way like the first phase of the insulin secretion in the normal healthy person. They're not available in South Africa, they will come. The other way to develop the uh, uh, diabetes um, armamentarium was using different uh, concentrations of insulins. The more concentrated insulin, they are absorbing slower. You can use lower volumes, which makes a big difference if you're dealing with the patient who are using higher doses, patient with insulin resistance, type two diabetics, who need to inject often 100 or even more units or one unit per kilogram. So the insulin 200, 300, and 500 are giving very nice flat profile, and they also can be used once or twice a day, covering nicely 24-hour period. This slide is showing you development from the conventional insulin therapy to intensive insulin therapy with basal bolus regimen to insulin pumps. Insulin pumps are getting really momentum and they are very sophisticated. On the very right side, you can see the so-called hybrid pancreas, which means that there is a pump coming with glucose sensor. There is a continuous communication between the pump and the sensor. Insulin infusion is adjusted based on the glucose levels. If the sugar is too low, insulin infusion is slowed or even halted. If the sugar is up, the pump can top up a sugar level. You still need to bolus uh, insulin for the meals, but the, the control is much, much better. This is another device which can be used together with insulin, insulin injector pen, iPen smart pen, which is keeping the track of the injections, helping to calculate the dose of insulin based on the results. Technology is taking momentum, there is no doubt. The smart insulin is the concept which is also uh, getting momentum. Idea is that you can inject the insulin, you will have a depot of insulin in the body, and then depends on the glycemic level, more or less insulin will be released. So this is, you know, something which definitely will make a big difference. Instead of using sensors and adjust this different way using artificial intelligence, in this st stage, the, the, the job will be done just purely by the osmotic, which are self-efficient. Now changing a little bit gear, I want to tell you about the problems which we are experiencing with treatment of diabetes, especially treatment with insulins and with sulfa drugs. The, the, the road for the diabetic patients is always the finding meaningful way between very low and very high sugars. And we learned recently that low sugars, we've been concentrated on the high sugars in the past. We know about complications. The studies are showing that complications are related to the uh, hyperglycemic exposure. 
But also low uh, sugar levels are important. As you can see from many studies presented here, the low sugar can increase the you know, uh, risk of complications, can increase the risk of cardiovascular complications, and also make patient's life very difficult because it's affecting your brain, heart, musculoskeletal symptoms, and circulation. The important thing is that episode hypoglycemia is not lasting a few seconds. The effect can last up to seven days. You know, problems with coagulation or problems with the response to the vasodilators up to 48 hours. So this is single episode of hypoglycemia at night can promote uh, uh, thrombosis, intracoronary thrombosis, heart attacks, or produce stroke. So this is why we, the new technologies or new management should address problems of preventing hypoglycemia. The other aspect of hypoglycemia is underreported. The studies like HUT study, which was prospective measuring of numbers of hypoglycemia show that doesn't matter type one or type two diabetic patient on the left and right. You can see that that amount or numbers of hypoglycemic episodes reported by the patients is much higher when we are looking for them. Retrospective reporting is the, the under, 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 uh, 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 the numbers are just uh, too, too low. This is also something which you will be um, exposed to dealing with patients who got recurrent hypoglycemia is a vicious cycle of the hypoglycemic unawareness because each episode of hypoglycemia is making you numb. You can't, the patient who got hypoglycemia doesn't respond to this hypoglycemia for at least 24 hours. And the threshold to sense the hypoglycemia is getting lower. So if the patient got a lot of hypoglycemic episodes, they may still function with sugar levels 2.8, 2.93, although with the brink of the second, you know, or eye, they, they can make a coma because they don't have a warning sign. So in this way, the prevention of hypoglycemia using the therapies, which are uh, like GLP-1s or SGL-2s, is helping to reduce this risk. If you want to calculate the hypo risk score, you can use the tool you can download uh, from the um, Apple um, store, hypoglycemia risk score based on this HUD trial. You just need to put the patient age, patient sex, duration of diabetes and HbA1c, and you will have estimate calculation of the risk of the hypoglycemia within 12 months. Another change of the gear now, variability is a new kind of hot uh, uh, topic in the diabetology uh, uh, management of the diabetics. The reason why, because we've been thinking in the past that hyperglycemic exposure, we can measure it by average sugar or by HbA1c level, is the only factor which is giving you um, uh, estimate of the risks. But have a look, it's like a London bus. One day you can have a bus, one day there is no bus, on another day there are two buses. The same happening with uh, glycemic levels. You are probably uh, you know, aware that the patients are very frustrated when using the same doses of treatments in the morning and behaving the same way, they've got completely different uh, value, various values of the fasting sugar. And interestingly, if you got big variability of the sugar levels, you may have still the same HbA1c level. So this patient, this two uh, theoretical patient, they got HbA1c about 7.8%, but the glycemic control for the 24 hour period is completely different. The patient with the darker color is got high variability. The patient with this lighter uh, less. And we learn that this variability can be another independent, independent factor which creates the risk of cardiovascular complications. If you measure the variability, uh, presence of severe hypoglycemia, the risk of maces or all-cause mortality is increasing in the patient who are very unstable when the glucose variation is high. So in essence, we are concerned now about the hypoglycemia and the glucose variability. This will translate to the better outcomes it can be addressed. This is how to measure your variability because in the era of uh, test, when the only test for measuring sugar was urine, it was completely out of discussion. Then the era of um, uh, glucometer is coming and we're learning that we can also uh, measure sugar more frequently. But this is how to describe variability is like to describe the elephant, you know, by blind men, you know, you don't really have a clue what, how the total picture looks like. 
So this test can help you to monitor sugar, but even the best, more compliant patient, they're probably doing something between two to six tests a day. So you got only part of the picture. This is the painting by Georges Seurat, who was a French post-impressionist artist who developed technique, which is called pointillism. So just few points creates the picture, but you don't really have a global picture if you see on the, on the details. The new technology continuous glucose monitoring allow you to monitor sugar automatically every five minutes, keep this on the record, and then download to the device or to the computer to analyze this. You can use the sensor for seven days, 14 days, or you can put under the skin for six months and they work. How they look, the graphic from the patient who is healthy, you got a very flat, flat uh, uh, curve. But if you're talking about diabetics, diabetics, you can see in the middle, this uh, glycemic uh, levels through the 24 hour period look different. So there is every five minutes readings, you've got hundreds of tests. If you've got for 14 days, thousand. So it's very difficult to interpret this. So the special way to present this data was designed. It's like with ECG, there is a coding system to you know, help you to interpret the ECG. The same is happening there. You've got the AGP ambulatory glucose profile report. On the top, you've got a few numbers about essentially time in range, which is the green spot, and time below and time above, the red and the yellow, respectively. In the bottom, in the middle, you've got a graph which showing you average day, and on the bottom, you've got 14 days. So then you've got a better idea how the distribution of glucose looks like, how the medication is, looks like, what you need to correct. So using this information, you've got a better picture of Surab painting than just using two or four readings. So at the end, we are dealing with the diabetes, which is a complex disease, talking about particularly type two. We've got different mechanisms and now different uh, drugs which are affecting the action. We've got metformin and TZDs working in the liver. Pancreas can be addressed by the sulfa drugs, GLPs, dpp 4 New class of SGL2s are addressing kidneys and so on and so on, brain, muscles, and adipose. So in essence, we've got a catwalk of the medications which really can be used in very sensible way and address the in needs of individual patients. We are living in the era of personal medicine. We need to find the best what patient can afford and what can be given to provide uh, you know, access to all the pathophysiological mechanisms. The new guidelines, this is example of the ADA guidelines, American guidelines, our South African are still behind, showing that we are going away, going away from the glycocentric monitor or management of diabetes. We are looking for the cardiovascular risk factors or renal risk factors, and then depends of the presence of the established cardiovascular disease or factors, we can choose between GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGL2 um, inhibitors, especially in the patient with high risk of heart failure, because these drugs should be started as early as possible. They modify the long-term prognosis and they start working relatively fast. The benefit of SGL2s in the patient with uh, cardiomyopathy is seen within weeks after initiation of the therapy. Again, I started with education as a tool to help to improve the cons glucose control. And I want to finish with another statement that we, again, should be far away from the glucocentric approach. The Stenop 2 trial showed that intensive multifactorial treatment, including lipid control, blood pressure control, therapy with dyspirin and glucose control, even with shorter period of time, can create the significant reduction of the cardiovascular outcomes. And the longer duration of the study was extended to 13.3 years, you can expect up to 60% risk reduction, relative risk reduction of cardiovascular complication. Absolute risk reduction was 30%. So we need to also pay attention to the other aspect. So we did it with type two diabetes, which is multifactorial disease, requires multifactorial therapeutic approach. We've got a lot of new interesting medication. We just need to know how they work, what are the particular problems in the patient, glycemia pro glycemic problem, cardiovascular risk, risk of the heart failure, and then try to use the best drug. Miles Davis from the era of 
playing in Quintent, then uh, work together with Gil Evans, who was a composer and excellent arranger. And they create more fascinating, beautiful music. And Maisk, I will recommend to listen to Sketches of Spain, which are probably the second last best-selling album. So it doesn't matter you starting with uh, your Little Black number one uh, or with Quintet and you ending with the big orchestra or the catwalk. The problem is that we need to be aware uh, that we've got really a lot in our disposal now and we can really make a difference in the life and prognosis of our patient. Thank you very much.